Hello brothers and sisters in Christ. I've been trying to get this video out for several days now. Um, outdoors, indoors, and just a lot of noise out there. we got spring going on. I'm going to be getting the garden set up here at the beginning of May. Um, getting the chicken coop today. I get, I get the joy of uh, cleaning out the chicken coop. Right? Mucking out, like mucking out the stalls. Get it all clean and good to go for springtime and summertime. I've got four baby chicks, and then I have a white hen decided, she decided all of a sudden, after I started raising some chicks up, she decided, well, I'm going to lay all my eggs. And now I gave her nine eggs, and she's down in the back, so springtime is here. A lot of work getting done. Now, we got a study here. It started out to be a small study, and over time, talking with the Lord as I do, and praying, and and going through the scriptures and adding it kept getting longer and longer to the point where I had to say, okay, we're stopping. It's time to get it out. So I've been trying to get this study out for the past few days. So please forgive me, brothers and sisters Christ, and please bear with me. Uh, we're still getting King James Bibles out to those who need them, so please pray for this ministry. Please pray for my health. I've been struggling with some health conditions in the last week, and I've been struggling with getting a lot of stuff done around here and volunteer work that I've been doing, uh, helping neighbors out. Uh, just pray for me and, and my usefulness in the ministry, oh Lord, uh, uh, brethren, to the Lord. And let's get into this. It's going to be a good long study, probably a two-hour study. Please be patient. Please have a love of the Word. Get out your King James Bible. We'll turn to some of the verses, maybe just the first verse, and then we're going to get through my notes, and we're going to go through this, this study. Question and answer. Is it possible for someone who is saved to preach another gospel? Now, it's not a bad answer or question to ask, but when we get through this, we're going to realize that that's a question you can ask, but a better question is, is regardless whether they're saved or lost, the better question we're going to learn is, is what are we supposed to do when someone's period preaching a false gospel, saved or lost? Okay, we're going to get into that. So under the Bible study, 1 Timothy 3.16, part 2, justified in the Spirit, when we talked about seeing of angels, and the next part we talked about the Bible, it says justified in the Spirit. I had a brother in Christ ask, I praise and thank the Lord Jesus for this teaching. I have learned a lot. Praise God. Please, brother says Christ, thank God and give God the glory when you learn something from the Word of God through a brother in Christ, whether it's me, through another brother in Christ. Make sure that we're giving God all the glory. I have a question, though, regarding 2 Corinthians 11.4. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, which we have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with them. Is it possible for someone who is saved and preaches the Jesus from the King James Bible for a, for a long time and the true plan of salvation, and, and then preach another Jesus and another gospel and turn against the Jesus, the King James Bible, and the gospel? In other words, down the road, they've been preaching truth for 10, 15 years, 5, 10, 15 years, and somewhere down the road, they get messed up. That's what this brother's saying. Is it possible if they have the Spirit of God within them to preach a false gospel? You have mentioned this a little at the 44 minute mark. Now, we are seeing more and more in the, is a great falling away from the truth in these last days, brothers and sisters of Christ. And yes, I've seen people preach truth and then turn from the later down the road, and when I hear this question, my first thought, my feelings and my opinions, my first thought is, is absolutely not. If they preach another gospel, they're lost, and they're on their way to hell. Now, I can't say, testify to this brother in Christ what he's going through. I can only testify what I've gone through, but I'm thinking... That he's going through some of the things I went through where you, you fellowship with the brother in Christ, you love this brother in Christ, you know their testimony, they got saved off the true plan of salvation, they believe this book, and five years down the road, ten years down the road, through the flesh, through, wor through the world, through Satan, they got off track and they've lost their way. And you look at them and you go, was I deceived from the beginning? Was I just so deceived? Was he lost from the very beginning? We're going to be going through this. Now, I believe, more than anything, that I'll say 90%. Let's say 90% and then 10% you want to put in the question mark where people are arguing over whether they're saved or lost. That 10%. I'm going to say 90. 
uh, it's probably even larger than that, but I'm being generous and saying 90% of the time you hear someone preaching a false gospel, they're lost. They're wolves in sheep's clothing that are preaching it. And then there's their uh, uh, people or followers, their sheep, their sheep that, that need good shepherds, and they're following wolves. And they're parroting these false gospels, which they're lost. 90%, and I'm being generous, are lost. But this fall, what the question is, 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 I think is falling under that 10% that everyone's arguing over and debating over whether they're saved or lost, this way, that. Let's get into it, brothers and Christ. Let's get into it. Get your King James Bibles out and follow along. Turn to 2 Corinthians 11, the verse that the brother mentioned. 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 11. 2 Corinthians 11, 1. Let's start in verse 1. Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly, what Paul's having to go through, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you a chaste virgin to Christ, one Jesus Christ, one gospel, one Holy Spirit. Amen. But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve, the serpent, Satan, beguiled Eve through his subtlety, you know, through good words and fair speeches, deceiving the hearts of the simple, that's the subtlety. And how did he beguile Eve? Yea, hath God said, he got her to doubt this. The flesh is always trying to get you to doubt this. The world's always trying to get you to doubt this. Satan is coming in trying to attack you with the fiery darts of the wicked, trying to attack you to get you to turn your back on this, which is why the whole arm of God's important. Okay. But first he says, Yea, hath God said. Then he turns around and says, Ye can be as God's knowing good and evil. He gets you to put down the real authority and replace it with this authority. With that authority, the world, the flesh, the world, the world's wisdom, man's wisdom. And sad to say, with some people, they get into doctrines of devils and start getting into doing things the Satan's way. Mm -hmm. Subtlety. As the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, yea, hath God said, you can be as gods, knowing good and evil. You can be the final authority. You can be the foundation. You can say what's right and wrong. You can choose what you want the gospel to be. I didn't choose. God's perfect written word, his authority, he says what the gospel is, not the world. Not Satan, not the world, not your wicked body of flesh that loves its sin and wickedness and doesn't want to ever be sorry for it. Getting ahead of myself, forgive me. So your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. The gospel is very simple. People just don't want to follow it. People do not want to come to God in true biblical repentance and believing in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Confess both in prayer and ask God to save them. They don't want to do that. It's so simple. It's so easy to do. Yet why is it so hard? Because the sorrows of the world worketh death. We'll get into that. For if he cometh, preacheth another Jesus, it just says he, who so cometh, preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye, ye, receive another spirit, which we, ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted. He's comparing the false gospel to the true gospel. You never accepted the true gospel, you just accepted a false gospel. You never received the true spirit, you just accepted a false spirit. You never received, accepted the true Jesus Christ, you've only been taught an antichrist, a false Christ. Okay. If ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. Him is talking about the serpent, Satan. Where's Satan going to end up? The lake of fire. If you reject the true plan of salvation, you're going to hell. Period. So in this context here, the person that is preaching, I believe, is lost. He's saying these people are lost, and they're going to lead you to hell. If you keep listening to them. And that's how we preach. Okay. If you have not accepted, you might well bear with them. Might well bear with them. That's where some brethren are starting to fail the Lord. Like, oh, they're just lost. There's nothing we can do. You need to try to witness to them. 
They might be pushing a false gospel. They are. They might be part of an organized religion, a false religion, which most of them are. We still need to try to preach the truth to them. Why? Because they might well bear with them. What's the might? As long as they're breathing, they can get saved and born again. It's not too late. The moment they die in their sins, without their sins washed away, with that debt still upon them, a price that they need to pay, and nobody's paid for them, they're going to hell. But until that happens, might, you might well bear with them. That's why Paul's preaching to them. He's preaching the true plan of salvation to these people. So they can get saved. Okay. Key word here, you see preaching, you see receiving, accepting. Okay. In the context of this passage, I believe Paul's dealing with false converts coming in to the Corinthians and messing them up. Wolves in sheep's clothing. Now, notice that, I put in my notes, and notice that someone is coming into the Corinthians and messing up the gospel. Getting them to say, yea, hath God said, a better remedy would be, ye can be as God's knowing good and evil. No, 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 no. What God told Paul and what Paul preached, that's, 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 it's sort of true. It's partly true. It's kind of true. But this is the real truth. Man's truth. The world's truth. Satan's truth. Who's the lowercase g God of this world? Satan. He got, he's got people coming into the Corinthians and messing them up. He's an evangelist. He, he goes to Corinth. He sets up the church. He leads people to Christ. Sets up the structure of the church and says, this is how it's supposed to be run. you got bishops, you got deacons, you got ordained elders. Here's how the donations are supposed to work. And this is how you're supposed to fellowship and hold each other accountable, being in subjection one to another and so on. And he sets up the church in Corinth. And then he heads over to Galatians. And he sets up the church in Galatians. Then he heads over to Ephesians. Okay. Then the Philippians. And by the time he gets over to Philippians, he's getting letters saying, hey... Something's wrong over there at Corinth, at the Corinthians. Someone's coming in and messing everything up. So he's having to go back to the Corinthians and say, hey, what's going on here? That's what we're reading there in 2 Corinthians. Then he gets a letter from, from Galatians. You know what he says, indeed, if you could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me, he's having to go back through all these churches over and over trying to set things right because the enemy, the wolves in sheep's clothing, are coming in and scattering the flock and messing people up. Brothers and sisters Christ, if you ever get in ministry, but even just with uh, brother and sister Christ, just when it comes to the gospel itself, I've never come across one person that's never heard the gospel. Not one. Or a gospel, I'm sorry. Never heard about a Jesus Christ that hasn't heard about the cross, hasn't heard, you know, what Jesus did and why he did it. I've never come across one person who's never heard of Jesus Christ. So, Brother Chris, see, Brother Jesus Christ, the number one thing we're doing in these last days, I, I sometimes think it would be nice to come across someone who's never heard of Jesus Christ. Never heard of him. And preach, against, preach to them against sin, about sin, and about hell, and getting into the gospel. That would be amazing. Everyone I've ever talked to has some knowledge, whether it's false or true, part truth, part false, or 100% false. They have some knowledge. And Brother Jesus Christ, what are we doing? In these last days, the number one thing you're going to find yourself doing when it comes to dealing with the world, professing Christians and, and atheists, flat out rejecting Christians, is that we are doing damage control. You say, well, what is that? You have a house that you're going to go into and you're going to um, renovate it. You're going to fix it up. And someone came to you. It's not that you're just going in, but you're going to offer your services to this person to say, hey, I can fix up your house. And as you come there to say, hey, I'm going to fix up your house. Here, let me show you how to fix up your house. The house is on fire. Why? Because someone else came along and told them, no, you got to burn everything. Burn everything. That's how you remodel. You burn everything. And we come in and we have to put out the fires and say, no, you were lied to. You were deceived. That's not true. And we have to put out the fires with the truth. Okay. You think it'd be easy? I'll just 
just I'm just going to sit here and preach the truth. Now you got to spend time showing them where they were lied to. I've done that so much where you're showing people this is the truth you were lied to by that person. In the battle building system, the false religion system, you were lied to, you were lied to, you were lied to. And that's what we're doing today more than anything. Trying to get those last few souls saved and trying to do our best to keep brethren in a standing position when most of us are fallen. And we need to get back up. We're doing damage control. Right? Now, Paul, another thing real quick, because I almost left it out. Paul, when he said, indeed, bear with me a little in my falling. You know what Paul was dealing with when it came to Corinthians and Galatians? And you'll see it mentioned in all of these books, a lot of them. Colossians, Thessalonians. What is he dealing with? He's dealing with the Jewish, some Jews coming in and trying to get them back under the Levitical laws. Ordinances. Okay? Uh, you got to be circumcised. Here in Corinthians, you have people coming in and saying, Oh, now that you're saved, sin is okay. Sin's not a big deal. Because why? In the Old Testament, they used to do animal sacrifices to cover your sins. And it got so bad that people would have doves, and everything. they haven't sinned yet, but they've got doves, they've got cattle, they've got sacrifices ready to go because they plan to sin. Sin's now okay because I can just get it covered when I do my animal sacrifice. Sin is now okay. So then you got these people coming in saying, hey, sin is okay. In Galatians, you got them coming in saying, hey, circumcision, you got to be circumcised. You got them coming in saying, you got to keep the laws, uh, the holy days, the Sabbath days, the new moon. And there's meat eaten in those days. In order to keep the holy days, you had to eat meat. In order to keep the new moon, you had to eat meat. And those days are coming back. With the time of Jacob's trouble going into the day of the Lord, those days are coming back where they're going to have to keep those days. But now, we don't have to keep them for salvation. And they're getting people to doubt their salvation because they're not doing this. Or they're not doing that when it comes to actual works that are based off the Levitical laws. Right? Today, what are we dealing with the most, Brother Sis Christ? It's so important to point this out. Today, we're dealing with the Catholic Church and all her daughters. Mystery Babylon, the whore of Babylon, okay, and her daughters and her harlots. And what it is, is they believe they've replaced Israel. We're the new Jews. We're, you know, we're the church. We're the new, you know, God's people. And then they start coming out with their own Levitical laws. They start coming out with their own ordinances. The Eucharist. Sprinkling babies. And all kinds of stuff. All right? They come out with their own Levitical laws and their own ordinances. And they're in, they've created a lot of false religions. And some religions that they didn't create, they infiltrated them. And converted them and got them to line up more with them than the Bible. But they line up more with, with the Catholic Church. They always have something in common with the Catholic Church. And we're going to these people trying to preach the truth to them. Saying, no, the true plan of salvation is this. Okay. And then we've, you've seen people that you preach the true plan of salvation. Oh yeah, that sounds great. Oh yeah, and everything. And then someone comes along and tries to get them over to Catholicism. And her daughters. Okay. That's what Paul's having to deal with. He preaches the truth, so comes in and gets people, yea, hath God said. And then they tempt the people with, you can be as God's knowing good and evil, just like Eve was. They tempt him, you can be the final authority. You can choose what gospel you want. You can choose what Bible you want. You can choose what organization, social club, organized religion you want, you can be the final authority. And they tempt you. And, and, and that's, people are jumping on that left and right. So before we get into the, to the meat of the question, because I believe the better question is, is it possible for someone who's saved to preach another gospel? We're going to learn that the better question is, is regardless whether you believe they're saved or lost, because people are going to be arguing that. They, don't, they might not see what you see in that brother or professing brother or professing sister. They might not see the changed life that you might have seen. You know, they might not see what you see. And you're going to sit there arguing with them left and right whether this person's saved or not. And it becomes a huge debate. But what we're going to really get into is what does the Bible say we're supposed to do regardless? Whether we believe they're saved or lost. 
That's the better question, and that's the more important question. How are we supposed to respond? How are we supposed to act? Okay. So first, I want to get through the true plan of salvation. So please bear with me. We're going to take about 20, 30 minutes, and we're going to really go through the true plan of salvation again. Please have your King James Bibles out. What brings one to Calvary? Well, first, where do we get Calvary? Luke chapter 23, verse 33. You get it from the King James Bible. It's the only place left to find Calvary. It's the King James Bible. They've taken out of all the Bible versions. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, they, were cruci they crucified him and the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. I want to read that verse because we need to know where we get Calvary from. The King James Bible, God's perfect written word. So what brings people to Calvary? Matthew 10, 28 we read. Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. You know there's people that get very worldly, very fleshly, very worldly. They care more about what the world's going to do to them. And they forget to fear God and what God can do to them. And will do to them if they don't get saved. But rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that do his commandments. His praise endureth forever. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That's in Psalms 111.10. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. The Bible says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that understandeth. There's none that seeketh after God. They've all gone out of the way. They've together become unprofitable. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. Brothers and sisters Christ, there was a time in the past where the preachers would preach hardcore against sin and not generalize sin, specific sins. They'd be preaching hardcore against drunkenness. They'd be preaching hardcore against fornication. They'd be preaching hardcore against that woman Jezebel. Today they call it feminism, but women, you know, cutting their hair short. Like guys' haircut. Guys cut, uh, growing out their hair long. Guys wearing women's apparel. Women wearing men's apparel. Okay? Uh, bearing false witness. Dishonoring your parents. I can go, there's just a whole list of them. They would sit there with the machine gun is the preaching, the bullets is the sin that they're preaching against, and they would just rally the whole congregation from left to right every year, left to right. And everybody would get hit by at least two of those bullets. Minimum. Me, I probably got hit by 15 of them. Don't kid you me. I, I came to the Lord as a sinner, and I threw my sins at the foot of the cross saying, This is who I am, Lord. I have fornicated. I was into Hollywood movies, TV shows, video games, porn. I had lied. I've gotten drunk, Lord. I've got drunk twice in my life. Just once makes me worthy of hell. It's sin. Drunkenness is a sin. One sin makes you worthy of hell. I'd have gotten hit by at least 15, but I'm trying to be generous. Say at least two. At least two. Okay. They would preach against specific sins. And then they would preach on hell, damnation. Okay. Where you go because of sin. They preach against sin, specific sin, and they preach against hell. And that was, that's what would bring people to Calvary in the old days. You know what they've done today? They've taken hell out of the gospel. Oh, you don't preach against hell. You don't preach against hell at all. That's, you don't guilt trip people and you don't uh, fear monger and threaten people. That's wrong. You, take, you don't preach against hell when it comes to leading people to Christ. Well, then what is God saving you from? That always trips them up. Well, then what is God's... Your sins. Why? Why are your sins bad? Well, because, because God just says... The, no, because, because of your sins, that you've sinned against God Almighty, He's going to judge you and send you to hell. They've taken hell out of it. And you know what they've done with sin? Instead of preaching against specific sins, they decided to generalize sin. And I hear this so much, even on me, I need to get back to preaching specific sins. And we do talk about specific sins, 
But a lot of times you see them just preach, oh, you're a sinner, I'm a sinner, we're all sinners. No, those preachers used to point at people. You're a sinner. You're a sinner. If you've committed adultery, if you've gotten drunk, if you've done this sin, if you've done that sin, they would be pointing at the individuals. You need to repent and believe in the finished work. You need to get saved. And they, they prick the heart. They convict them. They get them to get sorry for their sins. Okay. That's been taken away. And one of the biggest attacks they do, because we're going to get into repentance, what we call the first step. The first step is repentance. When you're preaching against sin and you're preaching on and warning about hell, real hell, oh no, hell is just a grave. Hell is just uh, the absence of belief. You know what they're doing? They're trying to replace everything with belief. Repentance is just going from unbelief to belief. Prayer, a uh, call, just means believe. Oh, hell, it's just, you know, the state of unbelief and separation from God, you know. No, it isn't. Hell is a literal place, a fire, where you're going to burn for all eternity. Lake, uh, uh, death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. And whosoever is not written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. The lake of fire is where you're going to burn for all eternity, but it's literal. Constant pain and destruction for all eternity. But they always try to make everything just believe, only believe, only believe. Everything's just belief, 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 belief. That's not what the Bible says. Okay? For the wages of sin is death. Brothers is Christ, repentance. I almost lost my train of thought, forgive me. Repentance, I'm going back to it. One of the attacks that they use is they'll grab stories from the Bible that show where they don't mention repentance, that's just belief. I don't know if, I don't have it in my notes, but the soldier. The soldier where the, uh, Peter, I think it's Peter and John, they're in prison. And there's an earthquake and all the doors open up. And you've got the soldier standing outside. He knows why they're in there. They were preaching against sin and hell and that Jesus is the way. He's the only way to get saved. Jesus whom ye crucified. They were preaching Jesus Christ, and if he's saving you, who is he sa what is he saving you from? Hell. They were preaching against sin. They were preaching against hell. They were preaching that Jesus is the only way. So here they are in prison, and it could have been Peter, uh, or Paul, I mean. I could have got the names messed up. But you have these people in prison that were preaching the truth. There's an earthquake. All the doors open up, and the man's standing there, and he sees that. He's about to kill himself. And it's Paul. I think it's Paul. Paul tells him, hey, don't kill yourself, we're still here. Don't kill yourself, we're still here. And he comes in trembling, fearing God, and he falls on his knees, humbling himself, sorrow. He falls on his knees. You can be standing up and be fearful, but he falls on his knees. And he says, what must I do to be saved? And people say, see, repentance wasn't there. Yes, it was. It was in his heart already. Paul didn't have to preach repentance to him. It was already there. Paul says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. So, brother says Christ, sometimes you don't have to preach repentance. It's not because you don't believe it. It's not because you're trying to skip it. If they're already broken because you've been preaching against sin and hell, which preachers are supposed to be doing, if you're already preaching against sin and warning people about hell, and they come to you broken already, you don't have to say, you need to repent, when they're already repenting. Okay? You can go to belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. But why do we have to hammer repentance so hard these days? Because people, I'm reading here, the Bible says in the Gospels where Jesus is having to deal with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes. He says, Heaven rejoice over one sinner that repenteth than over ninety-nine men, just men, who need no repentance. I don't know if it says just men, but they need no repentance. And in the next chapter, because I'm going through this, it talks about how they try to justify, these people try to justify themselves before men. And sometimes before God. They're, they're justifying themselves before God. Oh yeah, I might have did that wrong. I might have sinned there, but I'm not that bad. I'm not that bad. And sometimes they throw works in, saying, I do all these good works. But they also say, I'm not that bad. I might have sinned here, but I'm not a sinner. And they try to justify themselves. 
what we're dealing with today, brothers and Christ, is a lot of people trying to justify themselves in these false religions, easy believism, Catholicism, it's all just Catholicism, you know, Satan's church, and we come to them, and we try to preach the truth to them, what are they doing? They're going about to justify themselves. They refuse to repent. They don't, they've been told they don't need repentance. Repentance is just going from unbelief to belief. So all you need to do is believe. Well, what about prayer? Well, prayer is just, you know, call just means believe. So, so all you need to really do is believe. Well, shouldn't I be afraid of hell? Well, hell is just that unbelief and separation from God. But what you really need to do is just believe. Do you see how that's working? They're going against the book. So what do we do? We have to come in and hammer repentance hardcore. Oh, repentance is not, doesn't come before salvation. It's just something you do after salvation. Turn to 2 Corinthians 7.10. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. To salvation. It comes before salvation. Not to be repented of, but the sorrows of the world worketh death. You'll never repent on repenting. It's only who truly gets saved and born again. But for godly sorrow worketh repentance. And you know what they say? Uh, Corinthians road to hell. Oh no, they say Romans road to hell, but they take Corinthians road to hell when they hear something they don't like. Psalms 34, 18 says, The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart and saveth such that be of a contrite spirit. You humble yourself and you come before God saying, I'm wrong, you're right. I'm a sinner, you're holy. Lord, I'm so sorry. My heart is heavy with the wickedness of my sin. I'm so sorry, Lord. I never should have done it, but I did it. I'm wrong. That repentance starts at salvation and goes all the way through your life as a Christian until God catches us home. Catches you home in life or in death. But you got these people. Oh, no, repentance is just works. No, repentance is just going from unbelief to belief. That's not the true plan of salvation. The true plan of salvation is come to God in a bro with a broken heart, and a contrite spirit, having sorrow in your heart for sinning against him. Fearing God because he's going to, and fearing hell because God's going to send you to hell for your sins. And you come to him broken. And that's like that soldier. And what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Be saved. Be saved. Believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. 1 Corinthians 15.3 says, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins. How he died, and that he died for our sins. Why is that important? How he died, he bled out. In the book of Hebrews, it talks about without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sins. It also says in the book of Hebrews, when he's tr they're trying to preach Jesus Christ to the Jews, today, in the time of Jacob's trouble, and on, especially in the time of Jacob's trouble, that only Jesus' blood, the perfect Lamb of God, can actually take sins away, wash sins away. The Old Testament bulls and goats could only cover sin. It couldn't take them away. So how Jesus died, and you can go into the parts where his beard's been ripped out, beaten beyond recognition, crown put on his head, he was spit upon, he was cursed. One week there's telling them, Hosanna in the highest, praise you, you're, you're the Christ. The Son of the Living God, Hosanna in the highest, you're our king. And a week later, they're yelling, Crucify him! They're spitting in his face. But the most important part is the blood that was shed on the cross is God the Father's blood. And why was it shed? So that your sins can get washed away, so that you can be saved. That's repentance, how he died for our sins. That's where repentance is. Once again, what's he saving you from? Hell. Eternal torment, eternal damnation. He's saving you from hell. The hell and the lake of fire. Okay, He died for our sins, not the sins of the world. Remember, they're trying to generalize sin. Oh, it's just, I'm a sinner, you're a sinner, we're all sinners. Jesus died for the sins of the world. No, he died for our sins. Who's the R? Those who would come to Calvary. Those who would come to the cross in a broken heart and a contrite spirit. Throwing their iniquities at the foot of the cross. Throwing the old man at the foot of the cross. And they see God manifest in the flesh. And his blood that was spilled is God's blood. And it can wash your sins away. According to the scriptures. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Why is, it, why is that important that he was buried and rose again the third day? 
Okay? The belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. You have to believe that it's God's blood. In Acts 20:28, 20, we read, Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost have made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. You have false religions to believe that Jesus is just a created being and he's, equal, he's like a brother, him and Satan are brothers. Blasphemy. You've got false religions that say, well, you know, Jesus is just the archangel Michael or Gabriel. Sometimes I get mixed up in everything. Blasphemy. Only God's blood can wash your sins away. And if Jesus is not God the Father, the Trinity, well, God the Son is not God the Father. You're right, because when you separate the two and make them two separate gods, you're worshiping false gods. But the Jesus of the King James Bible is God the Father manifest in the flesh. Body and soul connected, they are one. Jesus is God the Father manifest in the flesh, and it was His blood that was shed on the cross. Okay? Take heed, therefore, to yourself over all the flock, and over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which He hath purchased with His own blood. It was God's blood that was shed on the cross. And how does it, what's the sign, the proof that, it, that Jesus is God? Well, He did a lot of signs and wonders. But here's the biggest proof right here. John 2.19, we read, Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. I can't raise myself from the dead. You can't raise yourself from the dead. I mean, the apostles were given the, the, the gifts of the Holy Ghost, and they could raise other people, but they can't raise themselves from the dead. Jesus answered said, Destroy this temple in three days. I will raise it up. I will. Then she said to the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spoke of the temple of his body. He said, He will raise it up. You say, well, that is, that's not enough. Okay. Turn to Acts chapter 3, verse 26. Unto you first, God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you, and turning away every one of you from his iniquities. God raised up Jesus? Well, someone says, well, he's talking about, like, you know, being born and everything. Acts 10.40. Skip over a few chapters to Acts 10.40. Him, talking about Jesus Christ, God raised up the third day and showed him openly. God the Father raised Jesus from the dead. And when Jesus said, I will raise it up, it's because Jesus is God the Father, manifest in the flesh. He is God. It's God's blood that was shed on Calvary. That is a requirement for, for the gospel. How he died for our sins according to the scriptures. And he was buried. When you're preaching the gospel, you preach that Jesus is God manifest in the flesh. He came in the likeness of sinful flesh. He came to be one of us. This is what he went through on the cross because of your sins and bled out. The blood that was shed was God's blood. And only that blood can wash your sins away. And you go on and on hitting the gospel. Okay? Some people, they, they make a mistake and they say, well... When they read 1 Corinthians 15, 4, or 3 and 4, they'll say, How that Christ died and was buried, according to the scriptures, and was buried and rose again. They leave out how he died for our sins. It's very important not to leave anything out, brother says Christ. Don't leave anything out. Now, 1 Peter 3, 18, we read, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Spirit raised Jesus from the dead. Jesus raised him from the dead. The, the God the Father raised Jesus from the dead. So you have the Godhead raising Jesus up, proving that he is God. Only God could do that. I can't do it. No one's ever been able to do it. In all of history, man, raised themselves up? No. So you teach the true plan of salvation is repentance towards God. Coming to God with a broken heart and a contrite spirit, having sorrow in your heart for sinning against God. Understand that your sins are sending you, because of your sins, God is going to send you to hell. You fear God, you fear hell, and you come to Him having sorrow for your personal sins. And then you get told about Jesus Christ. And you get told what He went through. And that the blood that was shed was God's blood. And if you go to Calvary, if you go to the cross... Throw your iniquity, throw the old man for the cross. 
When we're getting to here, confess both in prayer. That's when you go to the cross and say, Lord, I'm a dirty, rotten, filthy, low-down, no-good sinner on my way to hell, Lord, and I deserve to go to hell for sinning against you, Lord. I don't want to go, but I deserve to go there. And I believe that Jesus is the Son of God, capital S, Son of God. He is God manifest in the flesh. It's your blood was shed on the cross. And His blood can wash my sins away. Romans 10, 9, That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession, confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth in him shall not be ashamed. Shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. What is the confession that is made unto salvation? How? How that Christ died. You're confessing how he died and that he died for your sins. You're confessing your repentance. You're confessing your belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. That he died, was buried, and rose again the third day according to scriptures, proving that he is God. And when Jesus said, it is finished, it is finished. We don't have to go into that too much, but we're, once you get saved, you're sealed into the day of redemption. The eternal security, what they call eternal security, but the Bible says you're sealed. You have everlasting life. You're bought with a price. Repentance and belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And then the last part, ask God to save you. Once again, you have all these men trying to people that refuse to do that because they're trying to justify themselves before men. But in Romans 10, 12 says, For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And call doesn't mean believe. Call means ask. Genesis 4, 26 is the first time you see the word call being used as ask. 426, and to Seth, to him also, there was born a son, and he called his name Enos. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. Call upon the name of the Lord. They started asking God for help. We need help with this. We need help with that. Lord, we're sorry we failed you. And coming to him and falling on their knees before him and saying, we deserve this punishment. Lord, save us from this punishment. Save us from your wrath. Save us from your punishment. Forgive us, O Lord. They start calling upon the name of the Lord. You know what a good example in the Bible? Uh, turn to Mark chapter 10, verse 46. We're going to read the whole story of blind Bartimaeus. We did a study on this called uh, Courageous Man or Foolish Man. Blind Bartimaeus. I, I love this story. Why? Because it's how we all should have been at salvation. I was. When I finally got told the truth, this was my attitude when I got told the truth. And they and I was in a fall, I was a false gospel and a false religion. And they came to Jericho, and as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great number of people, this is Jesus, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the high wayside begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. You say, let's talk. Verse 48, you got people coming around. Oh, that gospel they're, they're telling you, and it's really pricking your heart, the true plan of salvation that we just preached, the true plan, it's pricking your heart. You got people coming along saying, oh, no, no, don't listen to them. Don't listen. Calm down. Be quiet. Shut up. Verse 48, and many charged him that he should hold his peace. But he cried the more a great deal, saying, Thou son of David, have mercy on me. And he's screaming it as loud as he can, trying to get Jesus' attention. Why? The Bible says there's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Not the Pharisees, not the Sadducees, not the scribes, not the priests and the Pope and all that garbage. Jesus Christ. He wanted Jesus Christ. But this is Christ, when I got truly saved and born again, I got told the true plan of salvation. I got told the real Jesus Christ that was different from the fake Christ that I was taught most of my life. The true plan of salvation. I wanted Jesus Christ. 
the real one. And I called out. Call means ask. God, save me. Lord, save me. Have mercy on me. I deserve to go to hell, Lord. Save me. I believe in this Jesus Christ. I got taught the real Jesus Christ, but most people it's just Jesus Christ. The Jesus Christ of the King James Bible, I believe what he did. Here. People say you can miss heaven by 13 inches. You have the knowledge of what Jesus went through, and you know why he went through it, but you never believed because you've never come to the cross. You've never come to Calvary in a broken heart and a contrite spirit having sorrow for sinning against him. David, have mercy on me. Verse 49. And Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man, saying unto him, Be of good comfort, rise, he calleth thee. And he, casting away his garment, rose and came to Jesus. Now we talked about this. When God calls you, you get saved, and God goes, Okay, I'm going to save you. You've cast away the old garment. The old man is dead and buried with Christ. He gives you a new life. It's a good picture of this. Casting away his garments, rose and came to Jesus. But here for this study, verse 51. And Jesus answered and said unto him, What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? Wait a minute. This is Jesus Christ. How many times have we read in the Gospels where you have the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes that are mumbling in their heart? They're not talking out loud. They're talking within themselves and they're saying bad things about him and God sees the heart and he calls them out. Tells a parable that calls them out. How many times where God said, I saw you, like Timotheus, I think it was Timothy or Timotheus. Timotheus. Um, where he saw people, and they're like, well, how'd you know I was doing that? Like, under the tree, before he came, when, I think it was, I'm getting names, please forgive me, brothers, this is Christ. But Jesus could see things, because he's God. He could see the heart of man, because he's God. And yet, he's sitting here asking this man, what do you want? He knows what the man wants, but why did he ask him, what do you want? The blind man said unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. He wants him to ask. There's times where they just fly out ask. There's times where they get brought forward and Jesus says, what do you want me to do? You got to ask. I receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, go thy way. Thy faith hath made thee whole. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. Brother says Christ, you want God to save you? You have to ask. We've asked. But they'll come along and say, well, call doesn't mean ask. Call doesn't mean ask. And after salvation, the new birth, okay, we preach that salvation, evidence of salvation, is the changed life. Philippians 3.10 says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. And the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. But the power of his resurrection. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. There's a changed life after salvation. And you know why we get attacked on that so much? Because they've done away with repentance. They've done away with preaching against individual sin. They've done away with warning about hell. They've done away with repentance. It's just going from unbelief to belief. They've done away with prayer, confessing both in prayer and asking God to save you. Call just means believe. It's only belief. And that never produces the changed life that the Bible talks about. The lost world can put on a show. The lost world can say, I'm giving up drunkenness because of my health, sorrows of the world. I'm giving up drunkenness because it's destroying my family, sorrows of the world. But they're not giving it up for Jesus Christ. Right? These false gospels are not leading to the changed life that Paul talks about and outlines. How a real Christian is supposed to live. How they're supposed to talk. What they're supposed to believe and stand for. They don't line up with this book. That's why they do away with the changed life. Oh, there doesn't have to be a changed life. Yes, there does. There was in me. And there's testimony from brethren after testimony after testimony how God saved you and gave you a new life and cleaned up your life. 
sanctification. Uh, remember the four tests of someone who's in Christ Jesus, made us into us wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. What's the end of, the, of wisdom? Keeping His commandments. Righteousness. You start lining up with this book on what Jesus, God, God manifests in the flesh. Jesus, His righteousness is imputed to us. We put on the breastplate of righteousness. We now represent the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Sanctify him through thy truth, thy word is truth. We now represent the truth and we stand for the truth, the true doctrines, the true teachings that are for today. And it talks about sanctification, getting sin out of your life because you're saved now. I, can't, I couldn't even fathom not being saved and saying, I don't want to get sin out of my life. I have no problem with sin. That's false converts. That's not someone who's truly saved. But they always fight it. And then uh, redemption, looking for that blessed hope. We live for Jesus Christ, the ministry of reconciliation. Okay, being a living witness and a verbal witness for Jesus Christ every day as we're looking for that blessed hope to be called home. Okay. So the true plan of salvation, sorry to go around, I, just, I love defending it. Repentance towards God. Sometimes you don't have to actually preach hardcore on repentance. If someone's preaching against sin and warning about hell, they can come trembling and fall on their knees, and they're already in the repentant state. So all you have to do is go to the second step, belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. This is the true plan of salvation. And when we're out there preaching, like I said, we're doing damage control. When you're out there preaching, somebody has heard something that's false. Remember, uh, when you're preaching the true plan of salvation, people have been given false gospels, and you're dealing with false converts to atheists. Remember 2 Timothy 2.15, or 2.25, 2.25, 2 Timothy 2.25. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledgement of the truth. The real Jesus Christ, the real gospel, the real spirit, the Holy Spirit. Remember, in meekness, we've talked about this before, some brethren get riled up, they can start taking things personal. We're serving Jesus Christ. And we're representatives of Jesus Christ. Not with the life we live and with our words. Okay? In meekness instructing them. Right? When someone's preaching a false gospel, whether you believe they're saved or they're lost, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. We go back to the beginning. I've said this plenty of times before. I've had brethren that I've talked about where I believe they're saved and they start getting messed up in sin and wickedness. They get, start getting messed up in worldliness. Their priorities get all messed up. God and His Word don't come first. The ministry and being a servant to the brethren don't come second. Anything else in the world comes first. And God takes a back seat. Okay, when they start getting over to doctrines of devils, and a false gospel is a doctrine of devils, what do we do? you got to go back to the beginning. you got to go back to the very first step. What was that? Salvation. Whether you believe they're saved or not, you go back to salvation. You preach the true plan of salvation. You remind them who it is that saved them, why they got saved, why they needed to get saved. And remind them, who is it that you serve? Are you serving your flesh, yourself? Are you serving the world and people in the world? Are you falling in the trap, deception, that you're like, I've never served Satan, but you start promoting doctrines of devils? You're serving Satan. Have you forgotten? You bring him back to the gospel. You bring him back to the truth. But you do it in meekness. Don't get angry, prideful, bitter, preaching out of bitterness, preaching out of pride and anger. People will say, righteous anger, righteous anger. Uh, we talked about this. There's times I get mad, Brother Sister Christ. I get mad at this guy right here first when I fail the Lord and when I fail you. I get mad at the body of Christ, the condition of the body of Christ, and I take it to the Lord in prayer all the time. I get mad at how wicked this world is and the direction this world's going. But when you get really angry, you need to go take some time with the Lord and give that anger to the Lord because if you hold that anger in, it's going to turn to bitterness and hate. And instead of bringing people to the gospel, you're going to be driving them away. With truth, stand firm for the truth. You can be, you can sit there and preach truth with, um, you know, like how do I say it, the Bible way of saying it. Um, oh Lord, 
You can speak with authority. There you go. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You can speak with authority and still be meek. People think in order to speak with authority, you've got to be like, rrr, rrr, rrr. No, you can speak with authority without losing your temper, without getting prideful, without getting bitter. Okay. Now, if they will not accept the true plan of salvation, Matthew 15, 14, we say it all the time, brothers of Christ, let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. If the blind lead the blind, they both shall fall into a ditch. If a man's a heretic after the first and second admonition, you go to them and you try to preach the truth to them. They don't want it. They don't want it. Reject. Let them alone. Okay. Most people tell you, forget Ephesians 6.15. Ephesians 6.15. When I am trying to preach the truth to someone who's a false convert, you know the number one, like if I had to do a percentage, the highest percentage of reactions that I get from them is anger. They don't try to witness back to me. They get angry. They get hateful when I try to preach the true plan of salvation to false converts, false religions. At first, they'll try to be like, oh, you're wrong. They try to, But when I just keep hammering them with Scripture and showing them right in their face, there's no argument. There's no debating. There's no questioning it. What happens? They get angry. They get mad. We're not supposed to be like that, brother says Christ. Why? Because Ephesians 6.15 says, And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Not anger, not pride, not bitterness, peace. Romans 10, 15, and you can speak with authority and be straightforward. And sincerity means sincerity and truth. This is the truth, and I'm just giving it to you. You can be blunt, as they say, but you can still be me you do it in meekness. You're not doing it out of anger. Romans 10, 15 says, and how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Now, I'm not saying you're guaranteed loss when you start losing your temper, but brothers and sisters, I've had disagreement with people online when it comes to the true plan of salvation, when it comes to the doctrines in this book, when it comes to the Bible version issue as it is, like this book being God's perfect written word. And I'm sitting there. And I'm quoting scripture, and I'm talking with them, and they get so heated, they get so riled up, they get so angry, they get so mad, they get mean. We're not. They get into name calling, backbiting, and whispering. They try to tear my character down so they don't have to listen to the truth that I'm preaching to them. Do I make mistakes? Absolutely. Does that mean this is false? Absolutely not. Can brethren fall into the trap of starting to act like them where they get angry and they get mad? Yeah, but we're not supposed to do that. We're supposed to be preaching in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. We're doing damage control, and that can get frustrating, and that can make us get angry sometimes, but we need to take that anger to God, and we need to preach the truth in sincerity. Right. And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace, and bring glad tidings of good things. We're there to preach good things. This is a good thing. The changed life is a good thing. Repentance is good. Belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ is good. Confessing both in prayer and asking God to save you is good. And when God saves you and gives you a new life, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, the new birth, the new man which is in Christ Jesus, these are good things. And we need to keep preaching it as good things, no matter how much name-calling they do, how much lying they do about us, stabbing us in the back, whatever, stabbing us in the back, whatever, bearing false witness, backbiting, whispering, the gossip. We need to keep preaching the truth. This is good news. This is the truth. It's not too late. It's not too late. You can still get saved. Remember that you might wear, well bear with them. Might. Why? If you're still breathing, it's not too late. To turn to the true plan of salvation. The new birth is a good thing. God can give you a new life that is in Him, and that is a good thing. And bring when we read Gospel of Peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Now, we're going to get back to the question. I'm sorry this is a long about way. The true plan of salvation is important, brothers and sisters. We need to keep pushing it. We need to keep fighting for it. 
And the question is, can someone who pushes that gospel and fights for that gospel for years get truly saved more again, can they turn? Well, is there an example in the Bible where men have turned from the truth to a lie and Paul has to go in there and correct them? Well, we've got the Corinthians where, God, where Paul doubts their salvation. He doesn't call them all false, but he doubts their salvation. As if any man be in Christ, if a man be called a brother, he's preaching the gospel for... Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, he's preaching the gospel to saved sinners, professing saved sinners. Okay? What about Galatians? We talked about Galatians. You know, how people are coming in and messing everything up. Galatians chapter 1. Let's read this. I marvel that ye are so, so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. So they receive the true plan of salvation, and someone comes along and says, no, it's just this. It's, for today, it's like we preach the true plan of salvation, and someone comes along and says, no, I know you did that and everything, but all that, was, all that mattered was belief. And that's all you should be preaching is belief. You got saved off the true plan of salvation. They come and tell you repentance isn't a big deal. Take it out. Prayer is not a big deal. Take it out. You did it. That's, but the main point was you believed. You believed. And that's all that matters. Man. But you have here to another gospel, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you. Some that trouble you. Like I said, behind every false gospel, if you track it back far enough, it comes to wolves in sheep's clothing. It comes, to, it comes back to servants of Satan. You track it back. Like you're doing, you know, you're, you're doing an investigation. Where did this start? Who started spreading this false rumor? Someone spread a lie, and you have to follow the rumor back. Okay, you didn't start it. You heard it from so-and-so. You didn't start it. You heard it from so -and, so and you trace it all the way back. You're always going to trace it back to a servant of Satan. Every time. Which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Now here we go. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so I say now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, remember before that ye have not received, they're talking about that ye have received, you received the true plan of salvation, and someone comes along and starts preaching a false gospel, you let him be accursed. Let him be accursed. For do I now I persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? That's important. Because we're going to be talking about what I believe some areas where men can fall away from the truth. They can be preaching the true class of nation. I believe that they can be saved. That 10%, you can argue with me. They're lost, they're saved. There's one way to treat both, lost and saved. And we're going to get into that. But I believe that some of them are saved. And what falls, what gets them to fall away? What did we just read there? For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? We'll get into that. For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. There's brethren in ministry that they've fallen into pleasing their wives first, pleasing their children first, pleasing themselves first, trying to live the life that they want to live. There's men in these battle buildings that care more about what the people think than what God thinks. And they want the praise of men above God. And they should not be in ministry. They should not be the servants of Christ. Verse 11. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after men. For I neither received it of men, neither was I taught it by the revelation of Jesus Christ. So the true plan of salvation where did you hear it? Well, so-and-so said it. Where did you hear it? So-and-so. And you trace it all the way back to who? Paul. The apostle to the Gentiles. And who gave Paul that, the true plan of salvation that I just preached? God did. It goes back to God. All these other false gospels, they trace back to men, servants of Satan. You know, Satan trying to transform himself into an angel of light and no marvel that his ministers also transform themselves into the ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their works. Where did they get it from? Satan. You trace it back. All right. So we read there about, do I persuade men or do I seek to please men? One of the ways that I've seen, I've seen a brother in Christ, and I'm going to give a, 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 a testimony, I've seen a brother in Christ that used to preach the true plan of salvation. I fellowshiped with him. I've done Bible studies with him, fellowships, some hymns with him, and he turned his back on the plan of salvation. Why? 
because I believe he married a Jezebel. Turn to 1 Corinthians 7, verse, chapter 7, verse 32. But I would have you without carefulness. He that is unmarried cares for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he that is married cares for the things of the world, how he may please his wife. There's nothing wrong with pleasing your wife, but what Paul's talking about, if it comes down to God or your wife, which choice are you going to make? Oftentimes, people often lean this way. Uh, 1 Corinthians 7.34 reads, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 34, a couple chapter, uh, verses down, there's, there's a difference also between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman cares for the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and in spirit, but she that is married cares for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. You can please your wife, you can please your husband, as long as it doesn't go against God. Fine. But if it goes against God, now you're being put in a position where you've got to choose between God and your wife, God and your husband. And this brother in Christ has no business in ministry whatsoever as long as his wife is running the show. And I called her a Jezebel because the Bible talks about that Jezebel to, that, that suffers to teach and to preach. Okay? He used to believe the truth. And I believe this brother is saved. I do. But he got married to a woman that's a Jezebel, and the woman kept gnawing on him and kept tearing him down and tearing him down and, and getting him. And now he, he's against the order of authority. That's the first thing we disagreed on. And I lost fellowship with him. I got kicked out of that fellowship group because I believe in the order of authority of the King James Bible. God, uh, God through his son Jesus Christ, Jesus is first in authority. Then the, the man, the husband, the father, the man... Okay, the, the ordained elder that's put over the widows, the man, then the woman, then the children. And I even threw in that study we did, I threw uh, animals and nature on the bottom because everything's backwards. They took God out of the equation. God's not the final authority. Then they made it where the animals and nature are, in a, are more, their authority supersedes man, woman, and children. And the children don't have to obey their parents and honor their parents. Children have more authority than the, the, hus the father and mother, the man and the woman. And now women are being taught, you don't, you don't need men, and you don't have to do what they say. No man tells me what to do, so their authority supersedes the man. The order of authority is so messed up in this world today. And we did a Bible study, this is how God set it up. And I got in trouble with this brother in Christ. I preached the truth to him. And he would say, okay, I've always believed this. This is right. I'm sorry. I don't know why I'm getting a little confused. This is right. He'd, he'd disappear for a day or two. And he'd come back all messed up again. And fight me on the scriptures. And this went on for, uh, for a few days, going back and forth. One minute, okay, yes, I, I, I believe this. Next minute, he's fighting this. Then he said, and come to find out, his wife was poisoning his mind. His wife wants to be a pastor, a preacher, a teacher, a Bible teacher, an evangelist. All these offices that are for men. Okay. And you say, well, this, you're kind of going off. I, I, I've already corrected him to his face. Well, on, on, a, on a video platform. All right. Brother says, Christ, that woman kept gnawing on him, and now I hear that he's teaching that repentance is just going from unbelief to belief. And I hear that and I'm like, your first thought is, Lord, was I wrong? No, I want to believe he's saved. What's one of the biggest, we just read there about Paul, when he talks about someone coming in preaching a false gospel, what motivates people to turn their back on the true plan of salvation and start leaning towards false gospels? Do I persuade men? Or do I seek to please men? I believe one of the areas brethren can fall away is trying to please the world. Now, can they far so, fall so far that they turn their back on the true plan of salvation? You to, you can, I'm not here to debate or argue. I'm saying, regardless, we're going to get into it. But I just want to say, one of the reasons I believe that you can, you're going to see, brother, says Christ, when you see people falling away, there's someone at the heart that they're trying to please. I've gotten into it with brethren when it comes to Hollywood movies and TV shows and video games and anime. And I just go, well, you know what? They're not, I don't, I'm just going to go back to the gospel because they're trying to justify those things. 
One minute they gave it away for the Lord, and then next minute they start getting into it hardcore, and then they start going to people that they preach there's nothing wrong with those things. Are they lost? It gets you to start doubting their salvation, but they're trying to please themselves. They start getting back into sin and wickedness. They got rid of their addictions when they got saved. God got rid of their addictions. God got them out of that addictions. God got them out of, away from those sins. And then they start getting back into it. Why? Because they're trying to please themselves. So then they start having a lighter attitude towards sin, and they start having a light, they start going for a false gospel. But the gospel that they received is still there. It's just they're leaning towards these easy God believism because of their sin and their wickedness. Like I said, you can always disagree a little bit. Okay. Once again, for godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrows of the world work death. This brother in question, he's starting to preach that repentance is just going from belief, unbelief to belief. And I got asked, what do you do? We're going to get there. Psalms 34, 18 says, The Lord is nigh unto them that have a broken heart, and save as such as being of contrite spirit. Psalms 51, 17, The sacrifices of God are of a broken spirit. Remember, you're supposed to be a living sacrifice. The old man is dead and buried. You're a new man. You're a living sacrifice that you gave the old man at the foot of the cross, and you're the new man. The sacrifices of God are of a broken heart, a spirit, and a broken and contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Do I believe that brother is saved? Yes. Do I believe he's fallen so far? I remember praying before we got in, before I even heard this question. I was praying to guys like, how far can, can brethren fall before you take them home, Lord? There's some teachings from some brethren out there that teach that if you fall far enough, God will kill you. And they're good teachings. That God will kill you and bring you home early and you'll miss out on rewards in heaven. You'll miss out on rewards. And down here, as you're falling away down here, there's still consequence to sin down here, which we're going to re read again. Okay. There's some people that turn their back on the gospel to please a group of people. They have the true gospel. Like I said, you can argue with them. They're lost. They're lost. The solution is still the same. How we're supposed to react is still the same, whether they're saved or lost. But I'm just throwing some things in here to warn you, brother, sister Christ, to not fall into this trap of falling away. If it comes down to you and your wife, or between God and your wife, choose God. If it comes down between God and your children, choose God. If it comes down between God and your extended family, you choose God. When it comes down to God and your job and so you know the people of the world, you choose God. If it comes down between you and your flesh and God, you choose God. I can keep going on and on. What causes people to stumble and turn their back on things in this book is when God doesn't come first. Pleasing God comes first. That's why we were created. Okay, to please God. What pleases God? For this is the whole duty of man. To fear God and keep His commandments. I fear. That's the whole teaching about fearing Him over fearing this world. The world says this is how we're supposed to do it. God says this is how we do it. I fear God over you. I fear... I fear God over my wife. You hear some men say, oh, my wife can be fearful. I mean, she can really lose her temper and get really... I fear God over more than I fear a wife. More than I fear my children. You know what I'm saying? That's what the Bible teaches. Another reason I, you see, brethren, especially in these battle building systems and these organized religion, these businesses, even online when it becomes a, a YouTube channel, becomes a business, and they're putting their logos on hats and, and cups and everything, it becomes a business... 1 Corinthians 1, 11, for, if, for it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chol, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of a Paul, and I am of Apollos, and I am of Cephas, and I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were ye baptized in the name of Paul? You say, well, how does that apply to what we're saying here? Brothers says Christ, Paul even put his name in there. And we're going to get to that. He says, though we, we, he includes himself in there, or an angel, preach any other gospel. Okay? Paul says here, okay, well, if Paul says this, I, I, I don't really agree with it, but I am a Paul, so I have to go that way. Paul has said this the other day, and it really goes against what I believe. But you know, 
I am of Apollos, so I guess I gotta go that way. You see this in the battle building system, that respect our persons. In their heart, they're like, I don't believe what he's saying, but I'm of him, I'm still going to defend him to the world. And now the world gets, starts believing that you believe what he believes, but in your heart you're keeping quiet and you don't believe it. But I'm of him and I've got to follow him. Could someone be stuck in that situation when it comes to watering down the gospel to get more people in these battle buildings? To get more, pe more donations from YouTube, like on YouTube, get more donations from people. Starting to compromise. You don't believe it. You got these people that are defending these men, and they don't actually believe it, but they're too busy trying to defend the man, being respecter of persons. John 12, 43 says, For they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. When I preach this watered-down gospel, I get more praise from men, than, and, but if I preach the true plan of salvation, I get more praise from God. What's more important? God is. But some men forget that. They, get all, they start to think more highly of themselves than they ought to think. Romans 12.3, the next verse. Romans 12.3, For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according to as God hath dealt every man the measure of faith. Some men start getting puffed up. They start thinking more highly of themselves, and then they start thinking they have the authority to correct this book. The third of the final authority, they just get puffed up, and it's all based off of the crowd, you know, the praise of the crowd lifting them up and everything. 1 John 2.16, what gets these men? For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, that's for us what we're talking about here, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. They start getting messed up in the world. The pleasing, the trying to get the praise of other men and pleasing other men. So whether it's pleasing your wife, pleasing your husband, pleasing your children, you're compromising, you're compromising to please them. Could that compromise get so great that you would turn your back on the true plan of salvation? I've seen, brethren, that I want to believe they're saved. I want to believe it. There's evidence there. I, I, I want to say they're saved. And they once preached the true plan of salvation, and now they're going over to easy believism to please their wife please other people for the love of money because easy believism makes more money than true biblical salvation all these false religions are making more money than standing for the truth right. so like I said if you disagree with me on that brothers says Christ if you believe that no one would ever because I said they wouldn't repent of repenting but I showed you in their heart they still believe the gospel in the, of the King James Bible but I'm of this group, so, and i got to please this group, so I'm going to stand with them. And I'm going to start taught, preaching this false gospel, even though it's not the gospel I got saved off of. It's not the gospel that I really believe. But they can, just, they can lose their way. And God will get to a point where I believe God will kill someone and take them home as he sees fit and says, Okay, now you've messed out on rewards and everything because you've fallen so far from the truth. Okay, there's chastisement when someone falls away. Uh, even on the littlest things, there's chastisement. God does things to get us back on the right path. Is that chastisement there? 1 Corinthians 9.14, Brother says Christ, 1 Corinthians 9.14, Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live the gospel. People always get on to me when I say you're not living the gospel. You're not obeying the gospel. Okay. Oh, you're trying to teach works for something? No. Paul said himself, Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live the gospel. That's why we're to have that changed life. We're supposed to be a living witness. The changed life, the new creature, the new birth. We're supposed to be living the gospel. God saved me from my sin and wickedness that was leading me to hell. Now he's cleaning up my life because I don't want to sin anymore because sin doesn't please God. And the wages of sin is death. God saved me from the death. Now I need to start pleasing God and he's going to clean up my life. You start living the gospel. Jesus saved me not so I can just continue in my sin. He saved me to put me on the right path to live for him. 
You know, it's not just about preaching the gospel, you're living the gospel. So let's get back into this. Galatians chapter 1, verse 8. The question was, can someone who's saved? Brothers Christ, we can sit here and debate all day. What is that person saved? Like I said, I might not see what you see. I might not, because there's some brethren that I say are false. And I've had brethren say, well, I've seen the changed life, and they preach the true plan of salvation, and they love the Lord and everything, and they gave up that stuff, like the Hollywood movies and TV shows. I didn't see that. All I see is a man professing to be saved, and they're in wickedness and sin. They look like the world, acting like the world, talking like the world. And I'm just going to preach the gospel to them. And I'm just going to say, I don't believe he's saved. You have someone, like I said, you have someone who says, well, I've seen this. We don't always see the same things, brother, says Christ. So there's going to be that debate there. Well, I don't think he's saved. Well, I, don't, I think he's saved. He's just fallen away. And I don't think he's saved. And it's back and forth whether they're fallen away or whether they're saved. But here's what the Bible says. Galatians chapter 1, verse 8. But though we, Paul's including himself. He's including the body of Christ. He's concluding false religions, servants of Satan. You know, Satan's ministers that are transforming the ministers' righteousness. He's including, he's including, I'm sorry, we. He's including we. I'm sorry. I, I, the next one, it says, if, if any man, any man includes everybody. I jumped ahead. Forgive me, brothers of Christ. Though we, he's including himself. That includes me. That includes you. That includes anybody that has a profession of faith, King James Bible believer, and that, you know, at one point they could have stood for the truth. Or maybe they claim to be a King James Bible believer and they've been preaching a false gospel from the very beginning. Though we, talking about the body of Christ, talking about him, men in ministry. Though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you, that, then that which we have preached unto you at the first, let him be accursed. That's the key right there, let him be accursed. As we said before, so I say, so I now, so say I now again, if any man, that's the part I jumped the gun, brothers of Christ, if any man, that would include saved and lost. Any man, any man, includes your wife, includes your husband that's preaching a false gospel, it, it, it includes children, uh, not children, but it includes trying to please your children, young people. I say young men, young women, uh, your fa extended family, co-workers, any man, that would include anybody on this earth, any man, preach any other gospel unto you than that which ye have received, let him be accursed. Anybody, let him be accursed. Now in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1, you don't have to turn here, but it says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, we're looking for that blessed hope. We're being gathered, we're living for him every day, looking for that blessed hope that could happen any day. That's how we're supposed to live. Living for Jesus Christ. That ye be not soon shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us. As that the day of Christ is at hand. I said that us because he said we. Though we preach on it. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. What's that day? The day of Christ. And that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. There's going to be a falling away. And the Bible says if any man preach any other gospel, let him be accursed. Let him be accursed. Brothers of Christ, Titus 3.10, we've already said this before, but Titus 3.10 is the address for the verse that says, A man that is a heretic after the first and second admonition reject, knowing that, that he that is such is subverted and sinneth, being condemned of himself. So you're sitting here wondering, well, could he be saved? Could he be lost? But the truth of the matter, brothers of Christ, you go and preach the truth to him, period. And if he wants nothing to do with the truth, you want nothing to do with him that's preaching the false gospel. Why? Because he's accursed. Down here, he's accursed. You're not to have anything to do with that curse. He's a heretic, and you're not to have anything to do with that heretic. Matthew 12, 37 says, For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. 
There's times I open my mouth, what well, that saying, open mouth, insert foot. There's sometimes I've said things that are wrong. But the point is, Brother Sister Christ, when someone starts turning on this book, when it's not in the doctrines, but it gets so bad that they're turning on the gospel of Jesus Christ, you go to them and you remind them the real gospel. You remind them the Jesus that saved them. If you believe they're saved, you remind them of the real Jesus Christ that saved them versus the false Christ they're now preaching. And you remind them of the true gospel that they got saved off of versus the false gospel they are now leaning to. The perverted gospel. You remind them of the spirit that they received, the Holy Spirit, versus the, the spirit that's behind that false gospel, the spirit of the world, that antichrist spirit that's now even in the world today. The, that woman Jezebel, we sometimes say the Jezebel spirit, but it's that woman Jezebel. You remind him. You go to him in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. Here's the truth. You're forgetting the truth. You're turning your back on the truth. If they flat out reject the truth... A man that is a heretic after the first and second admonition, reject. Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. If the blind lead the blind, they shall both fall into a ditch. Matthew 10, 14, we read, And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear your words, when you depart out of that city, shake off the dust of your feet. Mark 6, 11, And whosoever not receive you, nor hear, your, hear you, when you depart thence, shake off the dust under your feet for a testimony against them. You've planted a seed, you've rebuked them, you've corrected them, it's time to move on. You're go, you're, you don't get distracted by them. Get back to serving the Lord, get back to living for the Lord, keep praying for them. And I pray that anybody who's turned their back on this book, in any way, shape, or form, that they get back to a standing position, which is standing for this book 100%, and living for the Lord Luke 9, 5 says, And whosoever will not receive you, when ye go out of that city, shake off the very dust from your feet for a testimony against them. And in Acts 13, 51, you see, But they shook off the dust of their feet against them and came to Iconium. They moved on. They brushed the dust off their feet and they move on. I have such love for some of my brothers that I've seen fall away. And the brother in question that's turned his back on the gospel to please his wife, that woman Jezebel, okay, preach the truth to him and move on. Brothers and Christ, you don't need me calling out every single guy out there that's preaching a false gospel. I just gave you the true plan of salvation. If someone out there is preaching a false gospel, by all means, if God puts it on your heart to go witness to him, then go witness to him and give him the truth. And if they don't want the truth, you're to have nothing to do with it. If I'm the one always telling you to stay away from this person and stay away from that person it, specifically, then you're going to say, think that I'm the final authority. And if he says to stay away from him, then you have to stay away from him. No, the Bible says to stay away from him. You don't need me pointing every single guy out there. There's times where I do name names. There's times where I don't name names. I don't have to name names all the time. You, brother, sister, Christ, need to know this book. And you, brothers and sisters Christ, need to have the courage to stand for this book. If any man, I say again, if any man preach any other gospel than that which we have preached, let him be accursed. You need to have the strength to stand for this book and say, I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to part ways. I'm going to have to break fellowship with you. Okay? It costs, brothers and sisters Christ, it costs to stand for the Lord. I... I had to make a choice between my wife and the Lord. There's a lot of times I had to make a choice between the Lord and my daughter. And there's times where I failed the Lord and compromised to please my daughter. And there's times I failed the Lord and compromised to please my wife. But when push comes to shove and you're backed into a wall, and you get backed into a wall so bad that, you're gonna, that she's trying to get you to turn on the gospel of Jesus Christ to a false gospel... You need to, brothers and Christ, who's, you need to make, it, make a decision now after watching this. You need to go before the Lord, talk with the Lord, say, Lord, help me to put you first in all things. Okay? And I'll trust the Lord and acknowledge Him. In all thy ways, acknowledge Him and He will direct thy paths. Okay? Trust the Lord and lean not on your own understanding. It's an old song. 
Trust the Lord and lean not on your own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him. Lord, help me to make my whole life about you, that you come first in every area of my life. My marriage, being a father, where I work, my family, my own personal life when it comes to dealing with this wicked body of flesh. Help me to put you first no matter what. No matter what the cost. And I've lost people to the world. I've lost brethren to the world. I lost my wife to the world. Remember the sorrows of the world work at death? I lost my daughter to the world. Brother says Christ, it's not easy sometimes. It's, it's, it's a heavy burden. But the Bible says if we suffer with him, we shall also reign with him. Okay? Endure hardness as a good soldier, the Bible says. Okay? Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For this specific subject about the gospel. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. Brothers says Christ, stand, stand, stand for the true plan of salvation. Can somebody who's saved preach the true plan of salvation and over time turn, fall away to a false gospel? I believe it's possible. There's some brethren that tell me, well, I don't believe it's possible. But here's the thing where we definitely need to agree on. Whether it's possible or not possible, when they go to a false gospel, they are now under a curse from God. And we need to correct them, rebuke them, correct them, and try to bring them back to the truth. And if they don't want the truth, we need to stand for the true plan of salvation and you need to let them alone. I want nothing to do with you. Until you get your heart right with God and get back to lining up this book, I don't want nothing to do with you. They're preaching a false gospel. You ever remember that thing where you step back when someone would use the Lord's name in vain? There used to be that saying, people would step back. Why would they step back, brothers and Christ? They're waiting for lightning to strike. I don't want to be around when God chastens you or pours His wrath out on you. I don't want to be cannon fodder. You've ever heard that saying? I don't want to be like, you know... Civilian casualties, as you see today, like, you know, God's going to punish that man. He's now in a curse because he's preaching a false gospel. You want nothing to do with him. You want nothing to do with him. So, brothers and sisters, Christ, sorry for this long study. It took me a while to try to get this out. I know it's a long way to answer the question, but I really wanted to get into it. Defending the Word of God when it comes to the true plan of salvation. And when someone starts preaching a false gospel, whether you think they're saved or lost, you need to go to them with the truth and not be ashamed of the true plan of salvation. And don't fall for these tricks that the world uses to try to pull you away from the truth of the gospel. Trying to use wives to, to pull you away. Trying to use husbands to pull you away. Trying to use children to pull you away. Trying to use the ways of this world to pull you away, like clubs, Bible buildings, and clubhouses. Uh, the flesh trying to pull you away. Stand firm to the true plan of salvation. And always treat anybody, anybody, any man, any man that's preaching a false gospel. You treat them like they're lost and you go back to the step one and you, and you go out there and you preach the true plan of salvation to them. Okay? Do it in meekness. Do it with the heartfelt desire to see them get back up into a standing position if they're a false if they're truly saved and they've fallen away, you're doing it with the heartfelt intentions to see them get back to a standing position. If they're lost, you're doing it with the heartfelt intentions to see them get saved. To see them get born again. Right. So we're going to end this with grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And my love for you which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching and I will see you in the next study.